So it is the incident action plan, and it's based on ICS Form 201. And it wasn't always. Uh, when we used to do these events um, before Paul Burke got there, he used to work with the assistant by launch uh, We just sort of wrote up one or two page thing, this is what we're going to do. Paul used Form 201, and he actually, and now it's like, it's bigger every year, now it's like 30 pages. So I cannot emphasize enough how useful it is to use this form as a guide. Oh, sorry about that. So, anyways, that's, the, that's just the IAP objectives. So it deals with the command structure, assignment duties. I mean, every single person, because that day we had an extra 57 people on duty. And sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. One of the reasons we in EMS in the hospitals had so many people on duty that day was because a year earlier I was working, I think we had 900 people go off on dehydration. It was like 95 degrees that day. And so we were overwhelmed with people. They were flocking. They'd finish line, walk two blocks away, and pass out. So I had to call in, I had a, I had a fire alarm. I said, fire alarm, I checked with the deputy who was on duty that day. I said, give me an extra six fire trucks. I split them up into team the two, have a police officer, active security, because so no one will steal anything. And, I, and I, so I had like 12 teams spread out about four blocks away from the finish line, because that's what was happening. People were walking away and then they were flopping. But because that happened the year before, us, we probably had twice as many people on duty as the year before, but so did the EMS, so did the medical tent. It was really fortunate that that happened. So um, the IAP deals with everything, response protocols. So for example, if we have these teams, they call, I think it's for that in a second, but um, so that if say there's a you know, a building on the on the Amazon route, a central station can be. Can't send a fire truck, can you? So we have special firefighters that we call them uh, incident response team. They will go investigate, and we have a supervisor go with them, and so they'll check out those type things and then call for more resources if necessary. But that keeps fire trucks off the off the Amazon route, and that actually did deal with the recent events of explosion. That was actually uh, one of the go back here. That was actually in the incident action plan. So this is interesting. We do have special teams too. Um, it's three. It's, it's it's a person from it's teams. Uh, two people from fire hazmat, uh, uh, someone from the police, and three from the national guard. And we have multiple teams. We have one. And they were there for weapons of mass destruction. They have all the sensors to see if there was any uh, seizure and incidents. So they they have they have uh, standalone devices that actually monitored the finish line area. And then of course they had mobile devices as well. That became critical uh, the day of the marathon because it turns out it wasn't a dirty bomb, but it could have been. So we have 267 members on duty, 57 off duty were assigned that day to the marathon detail. Now, we've actually increased this from that day. Now we have three deputy chiefs. That day we had, we actually didn't have an EOC set up. Oh, by the way, there's, if you search after action report Boston Marathon, there's a lot of reports out there. And I, if you're really interested to go more in depth than I am today, I would suggest you do that. There's a lot of really good stuff. The state just did one. Um, uh, it only came out recently, and so, I try to incorporate some stuff into this, but that's a 200 page report. It mostly deals with police stuff because the, the marathon incidents itself were on the days, of course, um, and the police being the way they are. I have two brothers who are police, but the police being the way they are, they tended to forget about our contributions and stuff that they do. There was one meeting and Paul Burke was there and the, I think the colonel from the state police said to him, what are you guys doing there? Well, we were there. And so, it, but it's still a good report, even, and it doesn't deal too much with our response and EMS response, but it's, it's a lengthy report and it's worth reading. We had two deputy chiefs of the day, we had marathon operations. He was sitting in that mobile command vehicle right behind the finish line. He responded, of course, to the bomb site when it went off, but at the time he was there, we also had someone at the UCC. The police had set up a unified command center. It wasn't really an EOC, but it sort of functioned that way. I've been there a dozen times. And it was nice to always be there because um, uh, if you had questions, so the police, like when we do these big celebration things the first night, um, obviously someone might let down, but well, we don't want to have all the apparatus responding in because then you got 100 college kids who might all the apparatus. So we have special teams of fire apparatus and police cars who responded together. So that, that's, um, 
it's important that we have that liaison with the police. And then we had four district chiefs, non-division, self-division, Kenmore Square, and Hazmat Group. And as somebody, uh, you know, sometimes I could be in front of five, 70 guys, 70 firefighters uh, working for me, and people say, how do you keep track of it? I said, well, I don't have 70 people answering to me. I only have four or five, my, my second commanders. So it is. it worked well that day. It is critical on the fire ground. I don't know how anybody does it who doesn't sector the fire ground. Um, very important, and so we sectored it ahead of time. And each person had very specific duties. 